The circle is cast, the candles lit, the spell is spoken, and Mother Moon is watching all that we say and do. For the next short passage of time, you are in an enchanted place called the Witching Hour. Hi, my name is Elle Shepard, and this is... Hello, William. This is my husband, and welcome to the Witching Hour. Tonight, we'll be covering two topics... Pagans and Politics, a short lesson in the history of both, and Because It's Almost Upon Us, Deeper into Samhain, from a Druid point of view. So pull up a chair and settle in. This is going to be a bumpy but fun ride. Prior to the late 90s, pagans suffered one of the highest levels of discrimination per person of any religious group in North America. Here are some of the reasons why. Uneducated misunderstandings between two unrelated religions, such as Satanism and Paganism. Hundreds of years of negative and false beliefs about Paganism after organized religions permeated the cities and rural areas of the world with various forms of Christianity. It came to a head during the witch-burning times, both here in the Americas and Europe predominantly. Present-day religious hatred, ignorance, and misinformation against pagans, all paths and traditions, was spread primarily by conservative Christians. There are other religions and cults who do not tolerate paganism in any form, I admit. But most of them, while not Christian per se, still adhere to an Abrahamic Old Testament type of theology peppered with their own traditions of anti-pagan, in any form, ideology. Pagans have suffered grievous injustices in modern times to include having their religion used against them in the courts, to include losing custody of their children, jobs, housing, and being rejected by their own families because of their religion and for no other reason. Some of this oppression has been significantly reduced in Western Europe, especially the UK, Germany, and Nordic countries, most of whom simply don't make an issue of religion in any form. In the USA, because of the upsurge of public awareness about alternative religions and what they really teach, and the contempt for our religion has cooled off. Non-pagans and people of other faiths have become more aware of the benign nature of paganism and their connections to the earth and nature in general. Or so we thought. Many pagans yearned for the day they could come out of the broom closet and actually practice their faith as other religions do. Covens formed again and publicly invited others to look for a kinder, more nature-based religion to join with them. Public rituals on our high holy days became popular again. We even formed a National Pagan Pride Day. Today, paganism is the fastest-growing alternative religion in North America and the world, particularly the Wiccan path. Unfortunately, in other areas of the world, things have gone quite another direction, and it's horrible and historically familiar when I tell you. Christina Angela, writing for a public information group, states in Alternative Religions Forum in South Africa noted increased satanic panic hysteria in media reporting in our country. Also a lackluster response to attempts by pagans and other minority alternative groups to correct misinterpretation in the media and material disseminated and propagated by conservative elements in the local government departments, including law enforcement. She has written a document titled Satanism, the Acid Test, which is available online. Now for the present. In January 2017, the court swore in a man for the President of the United States who not only credits his election to every deeply conservative element of the American voter, but most especially of the Christian right, 
meaning those who call themselves the silent majority and who claim that because they have been waiting for this time since the signing of the U.S. Constitution, these same Christians claim that they would confirm this ignorant and unprincipled, unevolved man, even if he shot someone in cold blood on Fifth Avenue or groped and assaulted women at will. The price for electing this deeply flawed and horrific man to the highest office of the land was very simple. All he had to do was to ensure that Christianity was the only recognized religion of the land and that all rights of alternative religions were shoved back into the closet and that gay, transgendered, and women's rights were rolled back to 1950s or earlier. So here we are, on the brink of enlightenment, still quivering under our cloaks with no clue of what will happen to many of us in the coming years. I just saw recently um, on my Facebook page a recent example of what I'm talking about. The, uh, the picture, I wish you could see this, the picture is um, of Halloween and in big red letters it says, Reject Paganism, the Killing of Native Americans. And then it says, Mark 7, 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, ye hold the tradition of men. This was put out by Israel United in Christ. You can see what they are at www.israelunite.org. It's very strange because up in the corner of this uh, poster, it says blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans. And I have to be very, very honest with you. Those are the last people in the world I would call my enemy the last people in the world that I would think would embrace uh, denigrating another, another religion or another group of people. So, I can't tell you how many intelligent, lovely, faithful pagans are leaving their past and returning to some form of Christianity because they do not want to risk discovery or because they are genuinely confused and believe that if we are so hated and so maligned, then perhaps we are not a good religion. How could we be? We cannot even tell our bosses, our friends at work, the teachers of our children, not even some of the people we do business with, and most grievous of all, our own families. As I write this, there is a bill to make it easier for those same people to refuse not only the people they do not feel they should be forced to serve, but people like you and I, again. It is not my style as a very old witch, with nothing to lose and no fear from any of this, to leave you with a negative message. I grew up with this and learned how to hide the real pagan in me very successfully for 70-some-odd years. I did have the hope that prejudice was ebbing and on its way out with the rest of the human manufactured garbage, and I still do. Just be mindful of what is going on around you and try not to hide your faith and your love for your fellow man and mother's greatest gift to all of us, this earth, and this faith in any form that appeals to you, fight for it. Fight for it. Affect change where and when you can. But for God's sake, don't go back into hiding, especially behind a faith you are not really in love with. So many blessings. Now sit tight because Samhain is upon us. And here's another way some people celebrate. The name of this article is Deeper into Samhain from a Druid Point of View by Susa Morgan Black, Druid F.S.A. Scott. And here is my very handsome and adorable husband, and he's going to read it to you in his lovely, deep, sonorous voice. Okay, sweetie. To the ancient Celts, the year had two hinges. These were Beltane, the 1st of May, and Samhain, the 1st of November which is also the traditional Celtic New Year. And these two days were the most magical and often frightening times of the whole year. The Celtic people were in superstitious awe of times and places in between. Holy sites were any border places, the shore between land and water, seas, lakes, and rivers, bridges, 
boundaries, between territories, especially when marked by bodies of water, crossroads, thresholds, etc. Holy times were also border times, twilight and dawn marking the transitions of night and day, Beltane and Samhain marking the transitions of summer and winter. Read your myths and fairy tales. Many of the stories occur in such places and at such times. At Samhain, which corresponds to modern Halloween, time lost all meaning in the past, present, and future were one. The dead and the denizens of the other world walking among the living. It was a time of fairies, ghosts, demons, and witches. Winter itself was the season of ghosts, and Samhain is the night of their release from the underworld. Many people lit bonfires to keep the evil spirits at bay. Often a torch was lit and carried around the boundaries of the home and farm to protect the property and residents against the spirits throughout the winter. Many Irish and Scottish Celts appeased their dead with a traditional dumb supper. On Samhain Eve, supper was served in absolute silence, and one place was set at the head of the table for the ancestors. This place was served food and drink without looking directly at the seat, for to see the dead would bring misfortune. Afterwards, the untouched plate and cup were taken outside for the pukas and left in the woods. In other traditions, this is the night to remember, honor, and toast our beloved departed, for the veil between the living and the dead is thin, and communication is possible on Samhain Eve. Animals and food supplies needed special protection during this time, too. Samhain marked the time cattle, on which the Scottish Highland economy depended, were brought in from their summer grazing to their winter fold. The gods were petitioned to protect the cattle during the long, hard winter. By now, the winter store of food had been harvested and stored. Sir Walter Scott wrote, On Hallowmas Eve, ere ye bound to rest, Ever beware that your couch be blessed. Sign it with cross and sain it with bread. Sing the Ave and the Creed. For on Hallow's Eve the night hag shall ride, And all her nine folds sweeping on by her side. Whether the wind sings slowly or loud, Stealing through moonshine or swathed in cloud, He that dares sit in St. Swithin's chair, When the night hag wings the troubled air. Questions three. When he speaks the spell, he must ask and she must tell. Samhain is also the night of the great Sabbat for the witches, Van Druid in Scots Gaelic. On Hallowmas, all the witches of Scotland gather together to celebrate, prophesy, and cast their spells. Tradition has it that on this night, they can be seen flying through the air on broomsticks and eggshells, or riding black cats, ravens, or horses on their wild Hallowmas ride. The rural people did not dare step outside their doors for fear of this night. Some say the Queen of Witches is the Irish Morrigan, also called Morgan Le Fay. In other traditions, the blue-faced hag of winter, the Kaliak, rules this night. A good example of a Scottish Highland ghost story, as told to me by Clan Donald member Kenneth Wipert, is about Clan Donald's own witch. He told me the following tale. The McDonald's of Glencoe have their own witch. Her name was Sidiette, and she was a water witch with fair skin and red hair. She was always seen in a white robe with a black cape. Sidette often sings along the banks of Loch Lean, near Glencoe, and sometimes she is weeping. Shortly before the massacre at Glencoe in 1692, she was seen washing clothes at the ford of the river while she wept. Often the men said, Banshee, attached to a great household, is seen washing clothes or shrouds while she weeps prior to a tragic death or catastrophe. Sightings of this ghost go back as far as the 1100s. She is also known as the White Witch of Glencoe. Lachlin is reported to have a Kelpie as well. Fairies migrated from the summer hillocks to the winter barrows on Samhain night. If you had families that were captured by fairies that year, this was the one night you could win them back. Be snatching them off their fairy mounts as they rode by. The famous Scottish legend Tam Lynn is a story of a faithful young maiden that rescued her lover from the fairies on this fateful night. Many of the traditions of Halloween derive from pagan and druid customs. It is a time of prophecies, 
of disguising oneself to avert evil, or performing rites of protection from the dead and other worldly spirits. The ancient Druid practice was to circle the tribal Samhain bonfire with the skulls of their ancestors, who would protect the tribe from demons that night. In modern Scotland, Children have inherited the ancient custom of disguising themselves in costumes. These geysers wear masks or blacken their faces. They carve turnips in the shape of skulls and place a candle within, creating an eerie effect. The children travel from door to door, performing or singing for their treats. When they are not rewarded for their antics, they resort to tricks. Those with the second sight, Tybesir in Scots Gaelic, were often sought this night for a traditional Halloween fortune-telling. These persons were invited to gathering to entertain guests with their arcane arts. One method was to prick an egg and let the contents drip into a glass of clear water. The type seer could read the shapes, much like a crystal ball, and predict the supplicant's future. Apples were the fruit of the other world, a land sometimes called Avalon or Avalok, the Isle of Apples. They were often used for magic and fortune-telling. A young woman would peel an apple all in one pairing and throw it over her shoulder on Samhain Eve. The peeling would take the shape of the first initial of the man she would marry. Eating an apple in front of a mirror while combing your hair will conjure your true love's image in the mirror. Another tradition is dunking for apples. Apples are placed in a tub or barrel of water and dunkers will try to retrieve these apples with their teeth. Those who took seed will have good fortune the following year. Hazelnuts were also used in matrimonial divination. Two groups of sweetheart hazelnuts were placed within the hearth fire. One group was marked with the names of the village's eligible maidens and the other with eligible bachelors. As the nuts popped, the names of the pairs were romantically linked. On a more somber note, people sometimes placed a hazelnut with their initials on them in the hearth fire. If the nuts were missing the next morning, the unlucky person would not survive the year. Hazel is a sacred tree in Irish and Scottish mythology. In Ireland, nine hazel trees grew around the well of Sagace, where the sacred salmon lived. This was the source of all wisdom. Using hazelnuts at Samhain availed seers of that sacred wisdom. The glocus on cane on fittich. Pardon those who really speak Scottish Gaelic in my terrible pronunciation, but my good attempt at making it right. You did a great job, honey. I I really looked up all these pronunciations, and they didn't sound right. And One of them came up with two completely different things in the Scott Gaelic, Scott Gaelic. but we did give it, give it a try. Now, sweetheart, thank you very much for helping me. This was wonderful. I love the way you read it. And for those who are listening patiently, it's time to blow out the candles, pack our herbs, close our book of spells, fold our tents. But before I go, we'd really like to hear from you. We'd like to know what you'd like to hear from us on the show and how often. We'd also like to hear from you if you're involved in the pagan community and have something you'd like to share with the listening audience. It's even possible that you could come, if you live in the area, and do a guest spot with the Witching Hour. Contact us through the website, thewitchinghour.com. And last of all, I'd also like to thank the team of magicians who helped put this show together. So Rob, take it away and tell them what you're up to and how to find you. Bye-bye, sweeties. Thank you, Elle. The Witching Hour has been brought to you by the Coil Entertainment Network. Check out all of our programming on coil.us, C-O-Y-L dot U-S, And check out not just the shows, but the shop as well, where we now have a Witching Hour t-shirt. All proceeds go to support the network, so please give that a look. Oh, and uh, I think Elle has one last thing to tell you. Have a blessed Samhain. 